Good morning. A few years ago, Peter Doherty, former director of Princeton University Press and currently APS Press Director, suggested that I write a book on the state of the university. At the time, the topic seemed too daunting, and I said I wasn't up to it. He then revised his request and asked me to write on the topic of collegiality. Since I felt that this idea had sadly gone out of fashion, I suggested a different but related topic close to my heart, conversation. Hence my most recent book, Talking Cure, an essay on the civilizing power of conversation. Today, I want to get back to Peter's original request and connect the subject of that book to the state of the university. Therefore, the title for this talk should more accurately be Talking Cure for Higher Education. Let me begin by saying that I think that undergraduate education is in crisis, a situation more extreme and dire than anything we've seen before. We have lost a sense of what college should be, what students need to learn, what professors need to teach, and how colleges and universities should be run. Although our institutions are full of strategic initiatives and big data assessments, there seems to be a lack of deep thinking and wisdom, a word that has gone entirely out of use. This accounts in large part, I think, for the fraught and polarized state of our society. We are failing to produce critically thinking, deliberative citizens. Many students go to college these days because they feel they have to go. They focus on the competitive nature of getting in and celebrate if they can beat the odds and attend a highly ranked school. They then concentrate primarily on the next competitive hurdle, getting a good job or admission to a good graduate or professional school. Faculty members, for their part, are mostly interested in climbing the academic ladder if tenure track admittedly a dwindling number, or keeping body and soul together if not. Both groups must navigate the increasingly complex directives coming down to them from administrators. The administration, the fastest growing sector of the university, is a bureaucratic morass. The work of most administrators involves drafting strategic plans that no one takes seriously, dealing with legal and HR problems that defy common sense, developing time-consuming trainings for faculty and staff that are laughable in their simple-mindedness, overseeing a revolving door of hired consultants charged to research problems that no one has the nerve to solve, and raising money for projects that will end up costing more in the way of ongoing maintenance and support than the original gift. The administrators, enormously busy with all these useless tasks, earn salaries far beyond that of the faculty. This is a shift from ideas and values, once considered central in higher education, to money and metrics. Nothing embodies the situation more than the way MBA speak has become ubiquitous at university meetings. Everyone talks of getting into the weeds, addressing action items, drilling down, making a deep dive, and thinking outside the box. <laughs> this cheapening and flattening of language would never have been permitted in an earlier era when eloquent speech, sometimes verbose and pretentious, reflected a world apart from everyday commerce. A professor then spoke like a professor, with a large and flexible vocabulary, and not with a compendium of platitudes and buzzwords to accompany PowerPoint presentations. Some of you will say that I am exaggerating the situation. <laughs> well, this is my audience. <laughs> I admit to taking a broad brush to my topic. There are certainly schools where professors teach and students learn. And at every school, there exists some group of people who are genuinely engaged. I lead an honors college at Drexel, where I would say this is true. 
But I think these cases are exceptional and hard to maintain. My program, for example, serves only a fraction of the student body, and even here, it feels like a Herculean task to capture time and attention away from the more specialized, technical, and skills-based courses that, skill that students feel are necessary to land them good jobs. The humanities, once the foundation of the college curriculum, is now marginal, seen as soft and lacking in practical value. While I believe that a radical overhaul of higher education is called for, I also think there are small things that can be done in humanities education primarily, but extending beyond to improve the college experience. I want to address these smaller items here. As you'll see, they all connect to the overarching theme of conversation. For at the heart of the problem is a dearth of conversation in the broadest and deepest sense, a lack of opportunity for it, and as a result, an atrophying of the ability to do it. As an aside, Benjamin Franklin, the founder of the American Philosophical Society, was a great conversationalist. He wrote a delightful essay on conversation, and he created the APS to support substantive conversation. So this is certainly the right group for me to present this argument. Let me start with a seemingly trivial item that I think has large implications and that I think connects to my thesis, the scheduling, that I think connects to my thesis on conversation, the scheduling of undergraduate humanities courses. When students used to attend college, they would sit in a classroom with their peers for most of the day. Three credit writing, literature, history, and philosophy courses used to meet three times a week for 50 minutes each, or twice a week for an hour and 20 minutes each. This, along with other required and elective uh, courses, filled the nine to five weeks, week, and evenings and weekends were for homework and leisure. Now, by contrast, humanities co courses are often scheduled to meet only once a week for a three-hour block, in actuality, two hours and 40 minutes, often in the late afternoon or evening. In some cases, these are online or partially online, the residue of COVID that has remained. Daytime is for lab courses and large impersonal STEM courses, which students don't always attend in person. This scheduling runs counter to the discipline, continuity of ideas, and interpersonal exchange that college should be about. Yet the once a week meeting block and online and hybrid courses are popular because they are convenient for both faculty and students. Ease and convenience, unfortunately, tend to translate into tedium and discontinuity. These kinds of offerings radically reduce how much interaction students can have with professors and with each other. Yet because this is not something administrators can measure, it goes unheeded. Another factor that has weakened undergraduate education is the absence of a core curriculum and of disciplinary survey courses. These are macro and micro versions of the same thing. As the traditional canon has come under critique on various fronts, the idea of extracting some group of exemplary works, which in the words of the 19th century critic Matthew Arnold reflect the best that has been thought and said in the world, or more narrowly, within one field of study, has become an increasing challenge. The question, what should be chosen and who should choose? No one feels up to answering. This seems to me a failure of nerve and of vision. Vision, by the way, is another business buzzword thrown around but rarely given substance. University leaders should demand that faculty reach a consensus as to what all undergraduates and what all majors in a given field should learn. To be frank, it matters less what is chosen than that students have a group of text that they are responsible for in common, that these texts be admired as models of excellence, which doesn't mean they are without flaw, that they be open to review and revision on a regular basis, and that there be opportunities inside and outside the classroom to discuss them. Which me brings me to the final and most important factor crucial to making college more effective and meaningful, 
class size, and specifically seminar-style teaching of humanities courses during the freshman and sophomore years. It is a symptom of the wrong-headedness that currently pervades the higher education industrial complex that US News and World Report has recently dropped the category of class size from its evaluations. Small classes are expensive and difficult to assess, quantifiable assessment being the rationale for most everything at the university these days. Yet any seasoned educator knows what the philosopher John Dewey argued almost a century ago. When students take an active role in learning, they do better than when they are passive recipients. This supports the work-study model that more schools are introducing and which my institution, Drexel University, has had in place since the 1920s. But students also need to deal contextually with their work experience. And for that, they need another kind of experiential learning, engaging with others in an exploration of larger ideas. Small class size is necessary for this. Such classes, as I said, are expensive. But if taught well and promoted, the expense could be offset by gains in admission and retention, as well as in alumni giving. I refer to alumni giving, an area that gets a lot of attention from administration, because a good seminar is what students are likely to retain as the best part of their college experience long after graduation. I can use my own experience as an example here. The one enduring memory I have from my undergraduate education at Yale College some 50 years ago was of a first year British poetry survey seminar. The professor, Mrs. Finkelstein, we called our professors at Yale Mr. and Mrs. then, was a Holocaust survivor with a devotion to Western literature. I will never forget the discussion we had on the role of wonder in Milton's Paradise Lost. It was uplifting to explore the meaning of this idea and its application to our own lives. That class inspired me to become an English professor. I wanted to have that kind of deeply probing and joyful conversation with students of my own. A good seminar instructor is, in a sense, a good conversationalist, able to turn the classroom into a place of welcome, in current parlance, a safe space, where everyone is engaged and respected. The best instructor can make this seem effortless, knowing when to insert a comment, when to call on a reticent student, and when to remain entirely silent. The seminar leader can also be a high-level mediator, able to diffuse tension and challenge the dogmatic style of thinking that currently prevails on the college campus. As you probably know, students nowadays espouse social justice ideas in an often uninflected way that can inhibit an open exchange of ideas. In a seminar, the professor can lead the class to more nuanced thinking. I'm not saying this is easy to do, and certainly not all instructors, even good ones, can do it or do it well. Given our current climate, I have considered putting a statement on my syllabus that I reserve the right to take the devil's advocate position on occasion. This would be a useful disclaimer in the event of a lawsuit, but probably not very useful otherwise. Students are prone to take offense at what would, if understood in context, be inoffensive. The less practice they have in engaging in high-level conversation, the more they are likely to do this, to take a metaphorical or satirical point literally and discount the complexity of an idea or an individual. Last year, for example, when we were about to discuss the Declaration of Independence in a new program we offer in Civic Foundations, a student suddenly called out, I hate Thomas Jefferson. <laughs> she was the dominant personality in the class, and the excl exclamation would have had a chilling effect on the discussion had I not stopped to question why she felt so strongly about a gifted individual, albeit a flawed one, whom she had never met. I don't know what, that this diffused the issue entirely, 
but there was a shift in the climate of the room. A greater relaxation, I suspect, on the part of other students who were relieved to think that they did not have to hate Thomas Jefferson, <laughs> and that they, like Jefferson, were not expected to be perfect. Another related symptom of the current academic climate is that students espouse ideas that fit a prescribed agenda without considering their real life consequences. The seminar is a place where this tendency can be challenged and explored. Again, let me give an example that occurred recently in a seminar where we were reading one of Shakespeare's problem plays, Measure for Measure. An important scene in the play has the heroine, Isabella, appeal to Angelo, the kingdom's newly installed ruler and a seeming paragon of morality, to spare her brother, whom he has condemned to death for licentiousness. In a monumental expression of hypocrisy, Angelo offers to revoke this judgment if Isabella will sleep with him. Appalled by the offer, she refuses. And you may, some of you may be familiar with her famous line, more than our brother is our chastity. I was surprised to find that the students in this recent seminar, unlike students in earlier years when I taught the play, at first unequivocally supported Isabella's choice. She has the right to control her own body, the women in the class said, and the men nodded in agreement. When I pushed a bit, um, one young woman offered the following caveat. Personally, I would sleep with Angelo to free my brother, since we happen to have a very close relationship, <laughs> she said. But I can completely understand why another woman wouldn't. This led to a discussion about the difference between a generalized idea and what happens when things are experienced closer to home, and why empathy is so important when we are inclined to make blanket judgments. An obvious conclusion, you may think, but a lesson that more young people need to consider when they voice righteous indignation with regard to a cause or an idea. Finally, I want to share an example of how gratifying it can be to expose students to intellectual conversation with people outside their ken who know and have experienced a lot more than they have. My Honors College is currently part of an initiative funded by the Teagle Foundation that involves a seminar sequence for our first year students about civic history and ideas. The Thomas Jefferson incident happened in one of these courses. In another course in the sequence, we arranged a class visit to the Franklin Inn Club here in Philadelphia. Franklin inmates, as they call themselves, are mostly retirees in their 70s and 80s, all well-educated, conversationally adept, and with successful careers behind them. We had decided to discuss book eight of Plato's Republic, which deals with the inevitability of regime change from democracy to tyranny. The evening was delightful with much give and take around where our society stands on Plato's continuum. I could see that the students were exceptionally engaged. At the end of the term, when I asked them what they enjoyed most about the course, two a one, they answered, the conversation with the members of the Franklin Inn Club. These people had demonstrated a vigor and intelligence, but also a generosity and flexibility of mind in conversation that they admired and wanted to imitate. As my examples make clear, humanities courses are where most conversation can happen. Sadly, these courses are disappearing, even at the most elite institutions. As students become more career focused, they are taking more specialized coursework in STEM fields earlier in their college careers. Leisurely interactive courses that explore the context and history of ideas are being sacrificed, or in many cases, co-opted to serve ideological agendas. This must be reversed. By instituting a humanities-based core curriculum, as I mentioned, and by giving students more time to talk together about culture and ideas. I also believe that it is possible to have better conversations around STEM subject matter. 
There's a current movement to bring a more equitable perspective to the teaching of math and science. And the idea has received a good deal of ridicule. But if we could teach introductory math and science around a Harkness table, exploring alternative methods of problem solving, and explaining the larger conceptual ideas underlying them, this might open these fields to students who now find them unappealing or intimidating. Perhaps some instructors already do this. All I know is that students complain that their introductory STEM classes are large and impersonal, and that teaching is rushed and rigidly organized. Discussion sections where more creative kinds of conversations might happen are mostly spent reviewing problem sets or quibbling over grades. As an aside, a small reform for STEM fields, in my opinion, might be the elimination of grading on a curve, which is pervasive at my institution. This would signal a shift away from competition and hierarchy toward a respect for knowledge in its own right. The challenge for seminars in STEM fields, beyond the practical one of relaying large amounts of material efficiently to large number of, numbers of students, is finding good instructors to lead them. STEM instructors are generally not used to teaching small classes at the undergraduate level. Perhaps humanities instructors with practice in this area and now with fewer students could be outsourced, as they say, to help STEM discussion leaders. The cost of such an initiative would be considerable, but it might be better to fundraise for this than to build a new building or a more luxurious gym. A STEM humanities partnership in the classroom might also improve collegiality. I cannot end a talk about conversation on campus without addressing how important it is for faculty to converse with each other outside of their own fields. This used to be the great draw of an academic career. One could engage with a wide variety of people who loved ideas and had devoted their lives to them. There was time for long lunches and summers off to do research and share new knowledge with with interested people in one's own field and in other fields. But this aspect of university life has mostly disappeared. The atmosphere now is more competitive and more politically charged. Faculty clubs are, frequently, are, are not frequented the way they used to, to be, and many faculty dining rooms have not reopened since COVID. I mean, this is true at my own institution. In 1999, the American Association of University Professors put out a statement about the use of collegiality in tenure decisions. I quote the statement. The very real potential for a distinct criterion of, criterion of collegiality to cast a pall of stale uniformity places it in direct tension with the value, value of faculty diversity in all its contemporary manifestations. Not the most felicitous wording. But the view, <laughs> viewpoint makes some sense. The traditional focus on collegiality was sometimes a code for homogeneity, mediocrity, and support for the old boy network. But the combination of groupthink and careerism that has overtaken academia in recent years is another kind of blight. If faculty do not practice conversation of the best sort among themselves, it is unlikely that they can bring these skills to bear in the classroom. There exists a field of study called conversation theory that uses cybernetics to model iterative forms of exchange. This seems very far from the surprising kinds of conversation that can occur in a seminar setting. Still, this computer-based theoretical model might at least give, give administrators a tool to quantify the value of conversation. I tell the students whom I meet in my capacity as a professor and a dean that one of the goals they should have to enrich and broaden their perspective is to seek out opportunities to talk with a wide range of people. A college seminar is a practice space for this and as such, for life. It requires that students learn how to deal with new material, to listen attentively, to respond, and we're called for to civilly disagree. 
We need these skills in our future citizens and leaders to help heal the divide in this country. Along with these practical benefits, there are also spiritual ones. A seminar can lead to a mysterious kind of communion where those present temporarily lose themselves in the material under discussion and in the wonder of each other's minds. Thank you. Thank yes. you so much for striking a chord that resonates. I think so. I'm so Throughout glad. the room, I'm <laughs> sure there are questions and um, observations, anecdotes. Who would like to begin? Yes. Joel Cohen, New York City. Thank <laughs> you for uh, speaking the truth. And you touched in passing on <clears throat> a locus of education that I think deserves more attention, and that is the dining room. And I can remember as an undergraduate student at Adams House, which was analogous to the colleges of Yale, the houses mm -hmm. at Harvard, long conversations that went on long after the food line had closed because we were arguing about something and another venue for education is the extracurricular activity. The editorial board of the Harvard Crimson, the daily newspaper, had proposals of editorials which were then debated without faculty supervision in a room, the sanctum, where people came and expressed their views and there were strong opposition and there were really arg serious arguments and often there was an editorial and then a counter voice. And we learned to argue and to listen. And um, I think the extracurricular and the dining room, I I'd like to hear your comments about those. I agree completely and my greatest memories of Yale College was less, except for one or two seminars, it was the dining room. I don't know if any of you were at, in, at Yale in the 1970s. The food was extremely good, in my opinion. Maybe my mother's food wasn't good. That may be why it seems so good. Um, but the conversations, as you say, especially when you left a seminar with a group of people and you went to lunch or dinner and then spent continued to discuss what you had discussed in that seminar, and other things as well, as well as late at night in the dorm, talking way into the night. That was the great, and I speak to my students now about it, and they say they don't have time, or they don't, I don't think they have, see for me the core curriculum is so important for this. If you share the same reading, then you have something, you know, you have this third thing, that you can use to talk to each other, even if your ideas are very different, you can talk using that thing as a, as a mediator, so to speak. And I think there's less and less of that. So, you know, they don't have something really rich and deep to, to use for that conversation. But absolutely, there's nothing, I, I have a whole chapter in Talking Cure about food and conversation. There's nothing like sitting with a good meal, with friends, and talking about ideas. And that's what I think many of us went into academic life for, because we wanted to sustain that. There's a question yeah. here and then over here. Yes. Hi. I'm Ellen Winner. <clears throat> Ellen Winner from Cambridge, Mass. I taught in the psychology department of Boston College for many years, and I saw the biggest problem is faculty buy-in because the faculty want to lower their teaching loads. So we had a graded system. The more you yeah. publish, the less you taught. And they want to teach by uh, teaching very large lecture courses and <clears throat> using standardized tests so they don't have to read students' writing um, and, and using PowerPoint in their lectures. <laughs> and students are- I hate teachers. PowerPoint. <laughs> I, I used yeah. to sit in the back of lecture rooms because when we did peer evaluation, and I would see the students' laptops open, and they were shopping. 
um, a lot of shopping. So uh, the question is, how do you change faculty's mindset? Because they didn't really, at least in the social sciences, or I can only speak to, to my department, they didn't really value teaching. And teaching is, they always say, teaching counts as much as research and tenure decisions. But it, it doesn't. But it's not. Yeah. Unless you're a really horrendous teacher, that would count against you otherwise. So I, I think maybe at, at some of the small liberal arts schools, there is that more of a focus on teaching. But I would say it goes way back. Well, I think that we would have to change the tenure process and the whole publish or perish idea, which has become a joke, because now, you know, the, the, the idea of just getting more publications for the sake of them, and now that we have online publications, it's very hard to sort what's, you know, we used to know what the, you know, PMLA was the best in, in my field and so forth. We don't, it's very hard to tell quality, and even what someone else calls quality may not be what I would judge to be quality. Mm -hmm. The whole thing is, a, is very murky. I, I do think good teaching, though, is not. And you know, we, there are many ways to be a good teacher, but students know if you're a good teacher. And um, that really, obviously, I do believe that research and teaching should go hand in hand. But the overemphasis on research I guess for the sake of the prestige of the university, although it's not in, I think it's taken on a life of its own now, and it has to be totally rethought. Because I agree, faculty are very concerned with convenience or having time to do their own research. And that really shortchanges students. And students, you know, convenience for them too, they think that's better. Because if they haven't experienced the joy of this kind of learning experience, they, they figure the less time in the classroom, the better. So it's a sort of a cyclical process that has to be broken. And that's why I think that the whole of higher education has to be rethought. And that's the subject of the book I'm going to write. So <laughs> keep a lookout for it. Are there yeah. questions? That, uh, yes. Good. There's somebody back. Question here? Oh. Yeah. In the balcony. The question There's someone here. there. Okay. Yeah. Is there a question in the balcony? Yes. Yeah. Good. Sorry, it's hard to see. Yeah. Good morning. Thanks a lot. Mike Hout, Brooklyn, New York. I, I teach at NYU um, and almost in sociology, and half of our students are commuters. They are not in a dining hall yeah. with one another. And, and I'd love to think that a seminar would be a way to assemble them, but they're their attention is deeply divided by yeah. their commitments at home. Many of them also have jobs in addition to having to commute. Um, and, and so I, I guess my question is, do we have collective evidence here that the seminar is a way of supplementing or supplanting the, the missing piece of the, of the extended conversation uh, that some students experience in dining halls um, for, for, the, for those who aren't lucky enough to have that uh, all, total on-campus immersion experience that seems to be what most of us have. No, I agree with you, and I have had a lot of commuting commuters because Drexel, not as much now, but it originally was very much a commuter school too. And I know what you mean about the distraction and the other responsibilities at home. I guess I just feel that seminar is uh, the first, at least gives them a model, if it goes well for something. And that's why I tell students to talk to people, maybe on their commute on the way home, to talk to someone on the subway. You know, it's not the same thing, I realize, but to practice that engagement. And, um, you know, I just gave them, a uh, my students, uh, a, a, an assignment for Thanksgiving, which is to do something different uh, I, I gave them William James's essay on habit to read, that some of you may know, it's brilliant. He did it in two forms, one his technical form and one talks to teachers in another series of lectures. And he, uh, he talks about forming habits and, and breaking habits. So I told them to try and do, to try and form a new habit during Thanksgiving and talk to somebody that you wouldn't know, that uncle that you never talk to and that you avoid. See if you can figure out where he's coming from. 
And um, so I guess that's what I would say. If, and if you can talk to the students somehow and, and um, give them a sense of that engagement, I think that's the first step. There's no, there's no other, there's no uh, solution when people have hectic lives, I realize that. <clears throat> Someone yes. here. Uh, Philip Kitcher from New York. Um, I had the good fortune to teach at Columbia, which does have a, a freshman and a sophomore and other, other interdisciplinary courses for, for, for general yes. education. Um, I, I want to ask whether you need to, to go a little bit further than you've gone today. I th I'm, I'm, I'm all the way with you. But I wonder whether this should actually go down into the high schools and uh, to earlier stages of education whether this would be fostered by attempts at earlier educational stages to, to create people who were more comfortable talking to one another, less dogmatic, et cetera, et cetera. I, do you think this yeah. is part of a general educational reform, or is it specifically just directed at Well, I, it's what I know in the university. I will say I went to a large public school, high school, where we did, it was a, it was a revelation to me when I came to Yale to have these seminars, but they were wonderful. I immediately was converted. I agree with you, and I think, I remember being envious of those students that went to prep schools, you know, uh, Andover and Lawrenceville and so forth, who had done this already. Um, so I, I agree with you, that would be ideal, going back to, you know, primary school, where certain schools, I think, do teach philosophy in primary school. But, you know, again, I don't know how, how much we could institute that. I think our school system in general has many problems. I would concentrate on, because I do think that college students are still, uh, the word malleable is perhaps not the right word, but they're open. They're uh, able to receive the possibility of some other idea. Once they get to the graduate school age and beyond, they start to harden. So I would say this is a key time to, to get them involved in talking. Some are already, it's too late, so you're right. But I, I do think that college students, I love teaching them for this reason. Yeah. Thank you, Annie okay. reminds me that's yeah. the last question. We have a brief break.